released in 1930. There was the Plant Patent Act. This, uh, this allowed people to patent, uh, to patent plants, but it, was, it, it applied only to asexually reproduced plants, except for the tub tuber-propagated plants, such as potatoes and that. So this was just for asexually uh, 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 producing plants, and it gave uh, people that patent right. They could determine who could and could not use their plants. We then have in 1970, the Plant Variety Protection Act comes in, and it's actually, um, these are two separate things. The Plant Variety Protection Act gives these plant variety uh, certificates. It's sort of like a patent protection because you can exclude people from uh, buying those uh, plants. It only applied to sexually reproduced plants and tubers. Right, so they, it also included these tuber uh, propagated varieties, and there's 20 years of uh, protection, uh, except there were 25 years of uh, protection for a tree or a vine. But there were three important exemptions in the Plant Variety Protection Act of 1970. The first, farmer exemptions. That means farmers could do whatever they wanted with these seeds. They could save them, they could replant them, they could actually bulk them up and sell them to neighbors. So farmers could do whatever they wanted, with these seeds. There was also a researcher exemption. Researchers were exempted. They could do whatever they wanted with these seeds. Any research they wanted to do was perfectly okay. And then there was actually uh, USDA, there was an exemption for safeguards in the public interest and wide usage. And that's where the government could come in and say certain plants were too important uh, for our national uh, security. So what they could do is they could override that patent protection. They could pay the owner and force there to be compulsory licenses for two years uh, if the uh, uh, if the owner would not allow um, uh, uh, would not allow distribution of those seeds. So the Plant Variety Protection Act. Um, part of the reason for starting it in uh, uh, plant planting plant 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 patenting. You can go back many, many decades, and it, uh, it was actually because of rose breeders and others in the late 1800s and early 1900s. People would, uh, would spend all this money and time uh, developing rose varieties only to find somebody rip them off and sell them. So there was a need for this, and the Plant Variety Protection Act actually did a very good thing because it, uh, it allowed people, if they spent a bunch of time, they could have control over that, but it also gave uh, farmers these exemptions. And the reason this is important is because if you're a company and you want to force people to buy every year, uh, one of the ways they were doing it is they just made hybrids. Rather than open pollinated varieties, they just created hybrids. And since hybrids don't breed true, you have to come back to the market every year. But, you, but the problem was that it was very hard to do this with the uh, um, with rice and wheat and some of the uh, main crops. That's why they went to this plant variety protection system. In 1995, as the Asgrow Seed Company sued the winter borers because these farmers, they were saving seeds and uh, basically bulking them up and selling them to neighbors. And Asgrow um, actually took them to court and said, you cannot sell seeds. And Asgro won at the district court, but at the higher court level, uh, at the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals r ruled against Asgro and said, nope, actually, farmers, they can do whatever they want with these seeds. So not only can they save them, they can bulk them up and they can sell them to neighbors. Um, so to get around that, the people in Congress <laughs> Uh, doing their little bidding, they added amendments in 1994 to the Plant Variety Protection Act to get rid of that exemption, saying farmers can't sell the seed, but uh, they were still allowed to save, resave seed. Okay. Let's now look at key dates and patenting of life forms, uh, and this is what drives industry to buy up seeds. So the first one is this 1980 Diamond versus Chakrabarty. This was a Supreme Court decision. It was a five to four decision. It, uh, this is the first one that allows utility patents on uh, microorganisms. And what it was was uh, Nanda Chakrabarty was working for General, uh, uh, General Electric at the time, and he had developed a bacteria that was engineered to eat oil. The idea was you could pull it out on oil spills, and it would basically turn that oil to carbon dioxide and water. 
Um, they applied for the patent in 1972. It took eight years to make it up to the Supreme Court. And in the interim, what happened, which is uh, really interesting, is by 1974 or 75, it, was, it had determined that this stuff didn't work. It worked perfectly well in the lab, but what happened is when they put it out on oil spills, the bacteria that were normally there on the oil spills, they just outcompeted it. So there was no effect, so they then moved to this thing of maybe if we select bacteria that are on the oil spills and select for this property. Anyway, this turned out not to be, not to actually work, but then the Supreme Court, on a five to four decision, allowed this patenting, and that allowed patenting of microorganisms as though they were a machine. So that means you can totally control that because it's your intellectual property. And this is this notion that that means a scientist could patent something that was a living thing that they said that they actually created when all they did was add a little bit of DNA. That decision was only for microorganisms. In the ex parte Hibbard case in 1985, that extends these utility patents to higher organisms. So that includes, that, in, that included sexually reproducing plants. Right, so now you can patent those and control what you do with them. 1987 was the Harvard Oncomouse decision, and that's where Harvard, along with DuPont, they uh, patented a mouse that was engineered to be very susceptible to cancer. That's actually a very good thing if you're doing cancer research and you want to know if certain compounds are carcinogens, so that makes sense. This caused a firestorm of a controversy as soon as it was granted. Why? Because the implications were this was the first allowing now of patenting of mammals. The agriculture states went sort of crazy because the implications are if you could say patented a cow or a pig, you sell that to a farmer for the next 20 years since that's the company's intellectual property, all the offspring, you would have to pay patents and royalty. So that didn't go over really well in farm states. And then also the objection was raised, wait a minute, since this is now patenting of mammals, what would prevent somebody from patenting a human being? And the answer to that was the 14th Amendment, which is our anti-slavery amendment. Um, so that's a very important decision. It should be pointed out in Canada, uh, they do not allow patents on mammals. The next state that's really important it's in 1995. That's where the Marrakesh Agreement sets up the World Trade Organization. It comes into being on January 1st, 1995, and it's, uh, it uh, replaced the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades. And a lot of the issues that were going on, were, it, it was called the Uruguay Round to the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. That went from basically 1948 until 1995. That sets up the World Trade Organization. What's important is when WTO was set up, one of the most important uh, provisions, I think, for the industry was the TRIPS provisions, is what they were called, trade-related intellectual property. And what that, uh, uh, that part of the WTO agreement was not written by the US government. They gave it over, and it was functionally written by the biotech companies, the pharmaceutical companies, and the um, uh, and the uh, computer companies. And uh, what they wanted is, if you look in the United States, we had allowed utility patents, but nobody else in the world had done that. In fact, at the time, there was a thing called the Paris Union Treaty. A hundred countries belonged to that. Fifty of those countries did not allow patenting on either food or medicine. And the argument for uh, why is those were too important for human life, and, that's the, and those were places where the market doesn't work. The market works fine if you're selling shoes or something. You want to sell a fancier shoe for $200, fine. People will uh, pay for it, but if the price gets too high, then you're not going to pay for it. If you want those Air Jordans, if they're going to cost $1,000, people won't buy them. But when it comes to a drug that you need to live, the market doesn't work there because they can charge whatever they want. You can't say, well, my uh, drug that I need to live, it's too expensive, so I'm not going to buy it. You have to have it. And the U.S. had always allowed patenting on medicine, but all these other European countries didn't. And so that's why the cost of a drug in the, in the United States was uh, much, much higher in, than in other parts of the world. So from the drug industry, they wanted to be able to force everybody else in the world to do this. And in fact, in these TRIPS provisions, it said that countries that wanted to be part of WTO 
they have to allow patenting on life forms, or you can have what's called a sui generis system. So this is when the U.S. system that, uh, that allows these utility patents goes global. And once that happens, then it makes sense to start buying up seed companies. And Monsanto in the two years, two to three years after this, they spent $10 billion buying up seed companies. So now let's look at the concentration in the seed industry. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, oh, I should say after that, in 2001, uh, this JME Ag Supply went against Pioneer uh, hybrid because this was uh, this ag supply they basically brought up the issue that when the plant variety protection act was uh, uh, was uh, uh, patented congress didn't mean there to be utility patents and this this court decision says well they upheld the utility patents since con since congress didn't explicitly forbid it when the Plant Variety Protection Act, but they never thought of this. And you see, once you can control these things as utility patents, you not only can control what farmers can and can't plant, but when it gets to research, you can also control what research gets done. So in the United States, for example, because of this, if you're a scientist and you want to, for example, look at a safety issue or look at instability, you have to go to the companies and ask their permission. If they say no, you can't do that. Um, we do not think this is appropriate, as I've said in other places. This would be like, imagine where would we would be if we only allowed the tobacco companies to dictate the kind of research that can be done on tobacco. Um, and so it's bad for the researcher side. And of course, farmers now, the, the act of saving seed becomes a crime. It's a theft of intellectual property of the company's intellectual property. This caused um, furor all over the world because um, this notion that pants could be uh, patented when in, just by adding a few sequences and maybe 10 generations of selection, what about all the peasants that basically turned teosinte into maize? That, those, they're not recognized. What the industry argued, they called these things and language is important, they called all these things land races as though they were just there in nature and these are a common heritage of mankind that should be freely available to everybody, right? Uh, and then so companies can take that, basically take the thousands of years worth of work done by peasant plant breeders who are scientists in their own rights and they can, in ten generations of selection, patent that material. And this has uh, led to global fights. There are people that are trying to stop patenting on life forms because we've seen examples of, uh, for example, from uh, Mexico. People have gone down to Mexico and other countries and literally taken traditional varieties and then run and tried to patent them. This is when it becomes important to, uh, because seed companies, before all these patents happened, there were a bunch of uh, mom and pop companies because if farmers could save seed, they might only go back to the market once every 10 years. That's not a good market. If, uh, if you're a company in a free market system, you want a way to force farmers to buy seed from you every, uh, every year. Hybrids were one way to do that, but you know, many of the, the wheat and rice and some of these things that, that they couldn't hybridize, they needed some other mechanism, and that's uh, what they use patents for, these utility patents. And this has led to uh, a huge conglomeration in, uh, in the uh, global seed market, in the, uh, the commercial seed market. These are now the top six seed companies in the world. The top three, Monsanto, DuPont, and Gen in Syngenta, in 1996, they only, they only controlled 22% of the world's commercial seeds, seed supply. By 2011, that's 53%. And as you can see, the top six own 66%. Since this has come into being, um, Monsanto has continued to buy up seed companies. They just a couple years ago bought, I believe it's called Semininus. Um, yeah, Semininus. That's the largest vegetable seed company in the world. It was a Mexican uh, company and now it's owned by Monsanto. So now they have a lot of those seeds. So this is the concentration in the seed industry. And if we look at... Uh, agricultural inputs, pesticides. This is, uh, looks at the global agrochemical sales. And what you notice is the top six companies that are agrochemical producers uh, are also the same as the six sea giants. And those six companies, again, 76% of the global market. If, if we look at the top three, 
their percentage has gone from 33% to 52%. This is incredible concentration in the um, seed industry, and I was told I only had uh, 15 minutes. Uh, if, uh, uh, if I had uh, a little bit more time, I would show you some uh, slides, because if you actually look at the traits that are out there, uh, you'll see globally uh, the most important trait is uh, actually 85% of the global seed market uh, is in traits that are herbicide uh, resistant. So uh, the companies that sell the herbicides, if you can control the seeds, then you can make sure that the only thing farmers can buy are your patented varieties. And so what they've done is this has actually made it much more difficult for farmers if they want to buy uh, non-patented seeds because since the companies control what seeds are allowed on the market, they will only often allow engineered versions. And I, I'll give you one quick example and then um, and then um, stop. Monsanto has uh, developed a soybean variety that's called Vistiv Gold. And it's uh, with high linolenic acid. And what that trait gives you is that means the oil that comes out of the soybeans, if it's partially hydrogenated, is not a trans fat. Normally, soybean oil, if you're partially hydrogenated, it's a trans fat. Everybody wants. Uh, we now know that trans fats are actually worse than saturated fats. So if, if you can grow a soybean that gives you a non-trans fat oil, Every farmer would want that for soybeans. That was developed uh, via conventional breeding. It was actually via marker-assisted breeding. But the only way you can buy it is you have to buy it in a Roundup Ready variety. The same thing was true with a lot of the uh, BT varieties that, uh, that uh, came out. Farmers would complain that if they wanted the best genetics for their area, even if they didn't have a problem with the European corn borer, they could only buy that in a patented um, uh, BT variety. And in fact, when they were re-registering the, uh, when EPA was re-registering uh, the BT crops in 2000, they actually had a lot of farmers come forward and complain about uh, just this uh, topic. And I guess I will end. Um, what's been happening recently is we did have, since they used to uh, allow patenting on, you know, everything, there were people going out and patenting all these genes from humans. They were actually going out and serving indigenous people all over the world, particularly focusing on those uh, tribes and those folks that were close to extinction, not because they wanted to help them and preserve them, but because they wanted to find useful genes that they could patent. So for example, um, uh, if we look in the Sudan, there are some uh, prostitutes in Khartoum that are uh, resistant, that appear to be uh, completely resistant to HIV. If, if you can imagine, if you could find out what the, what the genetic basis for that is, and turn that into uh, medicine, that would be incredibly valuable. Uh, this you know, notion of patenting of uh, human genes and that has led to outrage among many indigenous people uh, because you know, they say you're here not to help us, but to actually uh, try to take some of our genetic material so you can make money. Uh, but what has happened is uh, with this BRCA gene, and that was where a company had um, uh, women that have uh, certain uh, mutations in this BRAC gene uh, are more susceptible to breast cancer. And so what a company had done is patented those sequences. And so they said if, if, if any doctor wanted to test their patients for this, they would have to pay royalties to the company. And they even said I I if you even thought about those mechanisms, that was also a violation. What the Supreme Court ruled actually is that no, you cannot patent gene sequences. Those are products of nature, so those cannot be patented. They left the door open. They said most of what's actually engineered into plants is not the same gene sequences that occur uh, in the natural organism. If, uh, if you take a gene from a bacteria as it actually occurs and you put it into the plant, it doesn't work. The plant recognizes that as foreign and it shuts it off. So you have to manipulate uh, at the nucleotide level. You have to manipulate about 20 to 30 percent of the, of the uh, nucleotide bases to make it look more like plant DNA. The amino acid sequence, because these are expressing proteins, is still exactly the same, but the nucleotide bases are different. Uh, what the court ruled is those might be uh, uh, those were excluded, and so those potentially could be patented, although I would argue that those sequences uh, that um, once you know what the plant 
sequence is that you want to put in. Uh, once you know uh, the gene sequence uh, for something that comes from a bacteria or whatever else that you want to put into a plant, the, the way to change it at the nucleotide uh, base level is sort of common knowledge, so anybody could do that. So I, I would argue that uh, if a case were brought, uh, you could make a proper argument that even these clonal DNA sequences that they're using for agriculture should not be allowed to be patented because that's because of the, ob the obviousness claim. And the Supreme Court didn't exclude that. They just said clearly for, uh, for straight gene sequences, they can't be, and they left the door open to these other ones. And so I think there's uh, some arguments that can be um, used here, but uh, this is what's driven the entire concentration of the seed industry. I would argue that if they never allowed patents on life forms, then you wouldn't see any, the biotech industry wouldn't have been interested in all this because they can't have a market. And they even waited to buy the seed companies until they could go global with uh, WTO. Because if you only have the U.S. market and you're thinking globally, that's, that's a really small market. So intellectual property is at the basis, uh, I think, of the problem with GE, and I'll end there.